Hey everyone, instead of just a standard review today, I thought I'd do something a bit different. A while ago, I made a video about the Core 2 Duo E6420 and mentioned that it is basically the exact same processor as the E6400, the only difference being that the 6420 has two extra megabytes of cache on board. I've talked about the specs of the 6420 in my video on that, which you can find a link to in the description below and on screen now, but I'd love to know what kind of difference the extra cache actually makes. Does it perform better? Does it have an effect on gaming? Or is it all just marketing, and does it actually matter at all? Well, let's find out by running both the E6400 and the E6420 against each other in some games at 1080p at stock speeds and with an overclock. But first, the rest of the system I'm using for the test today features 8GB of DDR2 RAM at 800MHz, an MSI GTX 1080 Armour OC edition for my personal system to eliminate any potential bottlenecking, a Foxconn G33M motherboard, Windows 7 Ultimate 64-bit, and the Fantex TC14PE to keep both processors cool. First off, to get an idea of what kind of impact, if any, the difference has on multi-core rendering performance, I fired up Cinebench R15, a multi-threaded benchmark popular with extreme overclockers that tests multi-core performance by rendering a photorealistic 3D image. I'd already run the 6420 through Cinebench, which you can see on the right-hand side now, and that, at the stock 2.13GHz speed with 800MHz RAM, managed a multi-core score of 106. The 6400, however, at the same stock 2.13GHz speed, with the same frequency RAM, managed a score of 102, which puts it at 3.92% slower than the 6420 at the same frequency. Increasing the core clock of the 6400 up to the same 3.3GHz speed I used for the 6420's overclocked run, puts it at a multi-core score of 158, versus the 6420's score of 164, a difference of around 3.8%. So as it seems, the 2 megabyte of extra cache is indeed giving the 6420 a slight performance advantage of around 4%, at least in Cinebench R15. But other than just testing and benchmarks, as I mentioned, I also wanted to run both CPUs through some games to get an idea of whether or not it actually has an effect on gaming performance. The first off for the games is GTA 5, a game that despite being a few years old now, is still massively popular and a great benchmark for processors and graphics cards. I wasn't quite sure what to expect in terms of any performance gaps, but as with my other reviews, I kept both tests as similar as I possibly could, to eliminate any possibility of the data being incomparable. Both CPUs at stock made the game unplayable, but as you can see from the average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates, which were 23, 4 and 3 frames per second respectively for the 6400, and 23, 10 and 4 frames per second respectively for the 6420, the 2 megabytes of extra cache in the 6420 is also benefiting it here as well. This can also be seen during gameplay as less severe stutter, especially in the city. The frame time graphs on screen now also show just how substantial the variance in frame times were between the 6400 and the 6420. Next, it's on to Rise of the Tomb Raider. I won't be testing Shadow of the Tomb Raider because I haven't completed Rise yet, so I don't want to ruin the story for myself. That and the fact I'm on benefit, so I can't really afford it anyway. But this is another game I found to show a slight difference across the tests. Again, I followed the exact same route through the game, to keep the data comparable, and played through the game as identically as I possibly could on both tests. Both runs showed completely unplayable performance, as I was expecting. The combat was pretty difficult on both sides, with severe lockups and stuttering occurring throughout the entirety of the test. The 6400 at times caused the game to actually run in slow motion, with very stuttery audio, but this wasn't present, or at least nowhere near as apparent on the 6420. Both processors had some severe issues with texture popping in certain areas of the map as well, namely the wolf den that Lara has to clear out for a member of Jacob's village, in which an interior of the cave took a significant period of time to actually render, and as mentioned, both processors exhibited some fairly substantial stutter and locking up throughout the game. Benchmark-wise, the 6400 managed average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 28, 8 and 4 frames per second respectively, with the 6420 managing 31, 11 and 7 frames per second respectively, again showing a slight performance advantage from the extra cache. Before I move on to overclocking, I'd like to give Skyrim a bash as well, specifically the original version of the game instead of the remastered version released a couple of years ago. For this test, I disabled depth of field through the game's INI file. Skyrim has a hard limit of 60fps, which I believe can be disabled, although I won't be looking into that for these tests. But that aside, both the 6400 and 6420 had the game sitting on that 60fps limit for the majority of the game, although both did show some micro-stuttering on the walk to Riverwood, with frame rates dropping underneath 45 frames per second. Performance indoors was pretty similar too, with fps staying between 55 to 60 frames per second, 
The 6400, however, showed a little bit of stir here. Both processors made the game pretty playable, and didn't really seem to be any different from each other in terms of performance. The 6400 showed average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 58, 35 and 13 frames per second respectively, with the 6420 showing 59, 37 and 14 frames per second respectively. So there is a slight difference in performance, but I would say both CPUs are near identical in terms of performance in this game, with the 6420 showing slightly less stutter at points than the 6400 did. With overclocking, I wasn't actually sure what kind of a difference it would make, given that I'd still be running both processors at the same speed anyway, but despite that, I thought it would be good to try that out as well. As I mentioned earlier, with Cineventure 15, I used a clock speed of 3.3GHz to keep the tests comparable, as that is what I used back when I did the 6420 video. With games, I had to run the 6420 at 3.25GHz, which required 1625MHz on the front side bus a voltage of around 1.4 to 1.42 volts. This put the memory at around 1016 MHz, which itself needed about 2.18 volts. So for fairness, these are also the settings that I ran the 6400 with as well. And putting this test aside, you could probably manage higher clocks yourself, but I'm pretty close to where the RAM would give out, and at a point where the voltage is getting towards being uncomfortable for daily use. With the 3.25 GHz overclock, the difference in terms of performance actually decreased in GTA 5. At stock, there was a substantial difference, but here, the performance is almost identical according to the benchmarks. In the city, the 6400 tended to be between the low to high 30s, with the 6420 managing to get into the low 40s at points. Elsewhere, performance was reasonably similar, and both showed micro stir and occasional brief lockups at times throughout the tests. The 6400 managed average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 35, 17 and 13 frames per second respectively with the 6420 showing average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 38, 19 and 14 frames per second respectively. So despite the performance gap between the two being a bit smaller, the 6420 does still manage to pull ahead due to the increase in cash resulting in slightly less stutter at points. With Rise of the Tomb Raider, the gap in performance actually increased with an overclock. Both tests still showed some pretty horrible stutter at times, and also had occasional lockups too. One major difference though in terms of performance between the two is that the 6400 still seemed to suffer from slow motion gameplay at points, whereas the 6420 didn't seem to be affected by this at all. There were also moments for the 6400 in which the FPS dropped as low as 11 frames per second, with the 6420's lowest being around the high teens. Overall, the 6420 was by far the better performer here. That's not to say it was playable, mind you, but in a fight between the two, the 6420 has substantially less stutter at points. The 6400 managed average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 41, 13 and 5 frames per second respectively, with the 6420 showing 43, 17 and 11 frames per second respectively. Performance in Skyrim was again near identical between the 6400 and 6420, with the 6420 seeming to come off a bit worse overall according to the benchmark. I don't really know why though to be honest. But that aside, the 6420 did in fact show slightly less stutter in certain areas of the game than the 6400, but unfortunately seemed to stutter a bit more than others. Performance is more than playable on both systems though, so despite the extra 2 megabytes of cache not really making a difference at all, either processor will be perfectly fine in Skyrim. The 6400 showed average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 60, 47 and 22 frames per second respectively with the 6420 showing average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 60, 46 and 18 frames per second respectively. Overall, it was actually quite an interesting test, as nowadays you don't really get the exact same processors being sold, with an increase in cache being the only difference. It's normally more or less coarse, and hyperthreading being enabled versus it being disabled, or differing clock speeds. You never really get to see what kind of difference a processor having more cache actually makes, so I was quite excited to have a question I wanted answered and to actually go out there and do the research myself and present it to you all. So, as it seems, with the exact same specs otherwise, an increase in cache, or at least going from 2 megabytes to 4 megabytes, does in fact have an impact in terms of performance in gaming. Probably only a couple of percent difference, mind you, but a difference nonetheless. If you enjoyed this video and feel like you've learned something, please consider giving the video a like or leaving a comment on it as well. You could also share the video and maybe even subscribe to my channel if you'd like to see more content like this. Hopefully I'll see you in the next one.